two of the Fall <laughs> Teaching Summit. Good to see you all here this morning, ready to learn something. A couple points of order. Uh, first, please check your cell phones again, put them on silent. And gentlemen wearing caps, if we could remove your caps, please. Thank you. The schedule this morning, we are in here for three hours. We will then have lunch. There will be a buffet set up in this room just behind me here, and we will be eating outside on the patio. So once we're done in here, we have an hour for lunch, and then we're back out on the driving range after lunch, where um, Greg Cesario from TaylorMade and Mike Malasco will be doing their presentations. So uh, restrooms are at this end of the building or at that end of the building if you need to uh, exit. So before we get started, actually, with uh, Mr. Thomas, I want to just extend a huge thank you to our section staff. You know, when we put these things together, and we've been doing them for a while, but there's still, so we kind of know what we're doing, but there's still a ton of work to do, and that falls you know, largely on staff. Once we decide you know, what direction we want to go to, then the staff is just huge in implementing this. And our section staff is unbelievable. They just, they, they do what we want without even us asking them. They, they do it, uh, you know, with a, a great amount of thought and a great amount of concern that we can put out the best product that we absolutely have. So I want to start with some people in the back of the room. Of course, Tom Addis, our CEO, who, who guides the ship. <laughs> yeah, but as Tom was pointing out, it's, it's mainly the, the people that work under him and that work with us with the teaching committee to get this done. David Murdahl, who is our main contact, our main go-to guy. Alex Teagles, who is huge in, in helping us set this up. Brianne Lockhart, who's right here at the camera, who's our communications person. Amy Stottleman, who uh, you saw at a check-in and is our roving photographer. And Sharon, Sharon Kerfman's not here this morning, but she was at check-in yesterday morning. And she, of course, is the, the queen mother of, of section staff. She's been with us for almost 15 years now. And uh, the nicest person you want to meet. And she loves coming to these events to just to meet guys and say hi and check everybody in. So let's really give it up for our section staff. Thank you guys. <laughs> Once again, you know, Desert Willow, Daryl Souza, Director of Golf, I thought he was going to pop his head in here, but this is just the most accommodating golf course staff that we could possibly have to do something of this measure. They really go out of their way to make it a success, and I can't thank them enough, and uh, unless something changes, we'll be back here next year. So when we decided to do the art and science of golf instruction, the first person that I thought of was Mr. Frank Thomas, who was here last year. Hopefully, those of you that were here last year remember his presentation, because if there's anybody that epitomizes the science of golf, he is it. 26 years as technical director for the USGA, and that means a lot. That's pretty significant. That means he's involved in rules and testing and just about everything that you could possibly be involved with when it comes to the science of golf and golf equipment. So huge amount of experience there. Uh, he then broke from the SGA and has formed his own, his own company called Frankly Golf, which is, he will, I'll let him tell you about it, but uh, amazing what they're doing and, and basically helping people become better putters, better players, better teachers, and on and on and on. And with Frank as his managing director of Frankly Golf with Valerie Melvin. Valerie, where are you? There she is, sitting right back here. So we had dinner with Frank and Valerie last night, and I've spoken with Valerie on the phone before quite a bit in, in setting these things up, and we got to know a little bit about her. And she is a plus one handicap, so I told her she's got to give me strokes number one. She's from Scotland. If you get a chance to talk to her, you just you know, this fabulous Scottish accent. But she literally won her club championship over in Scotland 11 years in a row. So she's the Byron Nelson of lady golf over in Scotland. So, you know, as we all know in this room, you win anything 11 times in a row, you're pretty darn good. So she's also pretty bright when it comes to putting. So as we do Q&A at the end, and you know, I'm sure Frank may call on her to answer some of the questions. Uh, and as Frank said, she's the boss of the company. But uh, anyway, without further ado, let me introduced to you three-time author, Mr. Frank Thomas, and he's got a new book coming out next month on putting, which I would uh, suggest and that you uh, take a look at. And without anything else, Mr. Frank Thomas. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Um, I'm really pleased to be back here again. And I, I think we're going to have a lot of 
time. I, I hope you're going to have a lot of fun, and I hope that, that I'm going to be able to help you understand some of the science of, of golf without knowing that you're learning. Because if it's a lot of fun, you come out of the scene and you say, well, I didn't know that, but now I know it, and now I can communicate that with my members. Because you guys are the sort of middleman between golf and no golf. You guys are going to help this game more than anybody else in the world because if you can help them, teach them how to play the game of golf, it's going to be so good for the game, I cannot tell you. And I want to make sure that that happens. And I want to make sure it happens because, because you're working from a base of knowledge. And that's very important to me. So, let me start by the, um, I think, uh, Bill asked me, he said, uh, you know, I'd like you to talk about an understanding of science of golf and, and whether or not it's going to enhance your instruction. I said, okay. And as a matter of fact, last night, as Bill indicated to you, I was talking to him and he, uh, he asked me for a basic quick summary of what I was going to be talking about. So uh, I said, Bill, I said, uh, uh, I think what I really want to do is uh, how, how to calculate ball trajectory and roll and overall distance using a computer simulation, but we first have to understand the coefficient of restitution of the ball to the club. We then have to understand the moment of inertia and mass of both the club and the ball. We then must understand the aerodynamic properties of the coefficient of lift and drag of the ball. We need to understand the optimum launch conditions, spin rate and ball speed, and how to control the launch, understanding the vertical gear effect. And, and I said, this is what I'm gonna be talking about, and so we'll all come out of here being able to calculate how far a ball is going to go by simulation. Uh, I said, but the vertical gear effect is very important. And, and I said, so we have to recognize that as you move up the clock face, you get less spin as you move down the clock face. And before I was even finished this point, uh, Bill said, wait a minute. And he said, listen, I. I don't think that's what I want you to do. So he said, uh, I said, okay, Bill, but that's what I told you I was going to do. I was going to prepare for it. And he said, uh, well, let's, let's somehow or other simplify it. So he said, uh, and he suggested very strong. I mean, I had to do, stay up late last night do, doing this. <laughs> and he said, well, understanding of the science of golf help enhance your golf instruction? And the answer is yes. So guys, now that's my presentation. I don't know what to say. I apologize, but uh, you've got what, you've got an hour and a half now to wait. You probably have gone to some balls or something. Um, I did think of doing something because science is just too complicated. So I'm going to tell you about my little sailing trip halfway around the world in a 25 foot sailboat. It's a lot more interesting than the coefficient of restitution of golf ball. So first I had to get a boat. I decided to go around the world. They so buy a boat and then fix a boat. The boat was 34 years old, it was 25 foot. It was so small we couldn't get out the harbor in Cape Town and Durban to actually go out and sail. So we had to go behind this big boat and go out into the ocean and do some practicing out there. I hadn't sailed before. I didn't have any navigation aids, there was no radio. I had a section that Columbus sailed around the world pretty well or halfway. So I thought we were okay. So I plotted the course. And the course we plotted was from the um, east coast of Africa around diagonally across. Unfortunately, this is called the Cape of Storms. Unfortunately, when we got around there, we had the worst hurricane that ever been seen in 21 years. 120 mile an hour gusts for 14 and a half hours. Eventually, we decided that we managed to get through. And then we continued to sail and uh, head due Northwest, uh, we were ahead of whale, we had broke our top mast, but every now and again the sea was beautiful and it was, it was absolutely amazing being out so far away from the ocean, from anywhere, only to find yourself 
in beautiful weather, no need to worry about your own lawyer. Thank goodness your own lawyer. And your own dentist and doctor. And we had nothing to worry about. Just sitting out there in the ocean, sailing along. Except for asteroids. <laughs> now, you, you think I'm joking. I'm really not joking because we had an asteroid that we discovered in 1997. It was called XF-11. And it was discovered in 1997, and then in 1998, we had a near impact where this is the Earth's orbit, and this is the XF-11's orbit, and in 1998 in March, if we were out of orbit by six hours, six hours, it would have, we would have had a collision. And we didn't even know it was there before 1997. And not only that, but this thing is coming back again in October the 26, 2028, Eastern Time, 2.30, so you can put your clocks back to look for that. <laughs> and the estimated distance is 500,000 miles away. That's just the other side of the moon. Just, just the other side of the moon. And if you look at this whole thing, there's the Earth. You couldn't even see the moon around it. And this thing's going to come just the other side of the moon. So the problem is, <coughs> and remember that date, 2028, October the 26th. The problem is, what happens if the NASA calculations are wrong? Huh? No more golf, no more anything. So this is actually very serious. We don't even know where all the asteroids are. So when you go out to play golf now, instead of looking down, keep your head up like that and pick up. And make sure you don't have any asteroids on the way in. <coughs> let's assume for a minute. Just let's assume for a minute it's going to miss us. Our cal calculations are wrong. And if so, we need to get organized. We really, really need to get organized. We need to improve our golf instruction. Assuming this guy that misses us, we'll still play golf. And we've got to do this through a clear understanding of the art and science of golf instruction. If you're going to teach somebody how to play golf, you have to understand why they play golf. And it's very important to understand this because if you don't, you don't know how to teach them what they're going to, where they're going to get their kicks out of the game. And you know, life is peculiar. We, we try to get rid of all the obstacles in our lives. <coughs> and then we sort of assemble a whole bunch of artificial difficulties into one entity. And then call it a game. Here we're getting rid of all the obstacles. Now we put all these obstacles in front of us. What's wrong with us? Well, it's fairly obvious that Man has a subconscious urge to evaluate himself. That's why you play the game of golf. You play the game of golf because it's inside of you. And that's why, the, and, and people who play a game of golf get a real kick out of getting the ball into the air somewhere down the fairway where they are aiming it. That's what gives them a kick. They don't get a kick out of playing with me or out of getting exercise. That's a wonderful byproduct, but that's not the reason why they're playing. They get a plan because it's a subconscious evaluation of themselves. You're playing against yourself. And not only that, but it's the only sport where you call in fractions on yourself. The only sport. It's the most wonderful game in the whole world. And you've got to understand that. And so we've got to help them evaluate themselves. How many times have you done this? Thrown a piece of paper, into the garbage can, across the room, gets in and you say, yes. There's nobody there to applaud, nobody there to say, well done. It's between you and the piece of paper and the garbage can. What about, you think people want the magic club? You know, we want a club that's going to hit the ball 260 yards down the middle of the fairway. Yeah, we do. That's what we want. 
Just think about it. If you had a club that hit the ball 260 yards right down the middle of the fairway, in your case, 300 yards probably, but most of the average golfers, if they could do that, and their buddies got it, they'd get it pretty soon. So all of you would have the same magic club. Why don't you just go down to the middle of the fairway, 260 yards, all of you drop the ball and start your game from there. Why do you have to walk up to the tee when you know exactly where the ball's going to go? So then you say to yourself, wait a minute, I really don't need that. I wanted it, but I really don't need it. And when you say that, when you say that you're as close to a philosophical understanding of why you play golf as you will ever be, your wants and your needs are not the same. And we've got to recognize that. Let me quickly get into the sort of club rule. In 1909 was the first time we developed uh, uh, rules on equipment. So did I, did I give some, some sticks and stones to you guys last year? Yeah. Okay, if you look at the back of that, the appendix of that, you'll see a, a, the best chronology on, on equipment rules change. And in 1909, it said the club should be of the traditional and customary design, must have no contrivances such as spring. In 1984, I changed the rule to say it must not have, any, have the effect of a spring at impact. And it's still that way today. So we just got to remember that if you're looking for constancy, in, in anywhere in the world, golf is a place to find it. Now, I'm sure that everybody here has been talking about coefficient of restitution or has heard about it, and every manufacturer is trying to increase the coefficient of restitution of his club and the moment of inertia. But really, do we understand? It? Now, when your member comes up to you or you're somebody who comes in, can you explain to me what coefficient restitution is? I'd like to have, say that you can after you listen to this. Basically, coefficient restitution is, a, is, is directly related to ball speed. However, it's a measure of efficiency of transfer of momentum, if you want to know the scientific term, but don't worry about that. If I threw a ball at 100 miles an hour into a brick wall, it would come out at something less than 100 miles an hour. And if you divide the outcoming velocity by the incoming velocity, you get the coefficient of restitution. So 100 miles an hour in, it bounces out at 78.78 is a coefficient of restitution. And that's because the wall is rigid, doesn't deform, doesn't have any spring-like effect, and that is about the coefficient of restitution of most good golf balls on their own. Now, that's not enough because somebody's going to ask you and say, well, listen, please explain to me why if the club head is going at 110 miles an hour, the ball comes off at 160 miles an hour. So what happens is, is the club head comes in, in fact the ball, not, not moving at all. It deforms on the club face. The club head slows down from 110 to about 76 miles an hour, and then it bounces off. But it's still going at 76 miles an hour. So here we've got a ball going, so the 160 <coughs> miles an hour, now what you do is you have to try and calculate the separation velocity and the approach velocity. So we know what the separation velocity is, 76 miles an hour minus 76, 84. And that's what persimmon woods are. And then when you calculate it, it's a 0.76. Is the, is the coefficient of restitution. Now with titanium, titanium, the same club head mass, traveling at about the same speed, hits the ball, the ball flattens out on the club face, and the club face deforms, and it stays on the club face for about, maybe about 40 milliseconds, I mean microseconds longer. The whole impact lasts for about 450 millionths of a second. If you blink your eyes, that's a tenth of a second. A tenth of a second. You can have 220 impacts in the time you blink your eye. That's how fast it is. So that's what happens there. And then 
because it stays on longer, you get actually less spin and the ball comes off at 165 because now the top face is contributing to it and that's why you're getting 165 miles an hour compared to that and that's what titanium. And that's the coefficient of restitution of 0.830. So now the USGS put a limit on 830 as a maximum coefficient of restitution, even though I wrote the rule and said no spring-like effect. It means you, no smoking in this room, guys, but six cigarettes is okay. That is the problem we face. So now we've got problems. So MOI. MOI is the moment of inertia. That's forgiveness. And basically, it's very easy to understand. You can take two clubs, take them, put the heads next to each other, and twist them like this, and then take the same distance apart, but put the heads on the end, okay? And now twist it back and forth. The, the, road, the difference in changing the direction is it will give you the effect. It's a very forgiving club, more forgiving when it's out. Same as when you take two barbells and you put them on, a, on, a, on, a, on the weights on the, on the barbell here, yeah? and you can twist very easily, really reasonably easy, but move the weights out. You haven't changed the overall mass of the club head or the weights haven't changed the mass of the system, but you have certainly increased the moment of inertia. Classics, absolute classics. The ping answer, everybody's stolen the idea and it's still moving out. You know, every blade right now is based on this that's being used. And then the ping I2 with the, with the first moment of inertia, high moment of inertia for giving clubs. Still classics. So we've got to recognize that that's what happens. Here's a, a, a putter. We'll be able to do it. Now we have the materials such as tungsten. We have a high moment of inertia about the vertical axis, giving you more forgiving across here. We've got a vert, mo, mo, uh, moment of inertia about that axis, giving us forgive, forgiveness up and down, and a moment of inertia about that axis, giving us this. So here you've got the, uh, an example of what happens. Distance is now dependent on the collision of the properties of the clock and the ball, and the most powerful, most powerful word in marketing is distance. Absolutely no question about it. And there are only two ways to get more distance. You can only get distance by increasing your club head speed or optimizing your launch conditions if you haven't done that. The only way you can get increase in distance. But most golfers have now optimized on their launch conditions. That's why we've got these adjustable or these uh, clubs that you can adjust all the time. Getting their increase in, in, in club head speed, I mean, you're not going to increase the club head speed unless you increase the length of the club. Or you change the, an individual who isn't swinging correctly, that's why you guys should be out there. You should be teaching people how to swing correctly and you'll increase the club head speed significantly. And it'll be significantly more than any club they can buy. If they go out and buy a new club, it's going to cost them $500. Why don't they spend even half that amount on lessons and they'll get an increase in distance significantly more than that club? Absolutely no question that instruction is important. Very, very, very important. Optimum launch condition. We discovered this some time ago. If you've got a top hit speed of about 120 miles an hour, about 12, 12 degree launch angle at 2,200 RPM, it'll change a little bit based on the ball that you're actually using, etc. But most, most golfers that we, you, you're going to be teaching have a top hit speed of basically at 80 miles an hour, 14 degree launch angle, about 26, even up to 3,000 RPM is about the optimum. But once you've got up to that optimum launch condition, you're not going to get any more increase in club head speed. I mean, not getting any increase in distance. However, you must also recognize that this is the overall distance. It's not only carry distance, it's carry and roll. If you want to get more carry distance, what you need to do is launch the ball a little higher with a little less spin. But for overall distance, and you have a fairway which is, which is reasonable, in, in average fairway conditions where you get about 25 yards roll, this will be your optimum launch condition. Now, you know, the USGA and the RNA are wonderful organizations. That without them, we wouldn't have uh, sort of a, uh, uh, any order in the game, and we have to develop people or develop an organization to do that, to look after the rules just very specifically. And most of them make sense. <coughs> Most of them make sense. The problem about USGA and RNA recently is that they're trying to stop the guys from hitting the ball too far. 
they see that these throwers are hitting the ball 300 yards and they treat the extraordinary as commonplace. So they think everybody's driving the ball 300 yards, so we've got to do something about it. And they're going about all sorts of little ways of doing that. As an example, I want to decrease the size of the head. What happens if you make a head that size? Oh no, we can't have that because people you hit the ball further and further. So we, we, so we put a, a, a size of 470 cc's on it. 460 is what it is because there's a tolerance. And then we put a limit on the 48 inches in length. And, and, and the average uh, length of, on the tour is 44 and 5 eighths. They have an access to any club they want to. So the 48 inches is ridiculous putting a, a specification in there. But as soon as you put a specification in, the manufacturer's going to go right up to the limit. Absolutely right up to the limit. Because USJ puts a specification in, beyond that or getting close to it must be good, must be better. Well, now we have the same thing on this. Put a limit on the moment of inertia. As a matter of fact, from 2,000 to 4,000 gram centimeters squared, don't have to worry about that, but that is because, you know, they, they say, well, you know, we're going to be too forgiving. The pros hit the ball right on the sweet spot anyway, so they don't have to worry about it. And from 2,000 to 4,000 is where your maximum benefit is. When you go above that, it doesn't make any sense. Then they put a limit on the length of a tee to four inches. And, I mean, I've never seen it. I, I don't understand that. Don't understand it. And now, they're saying, the ball's going too far. We, we permitted spring-like effect, which we shouldn't have done. Uh, and that increased the distance about 30 yards. So now let's roll the ball back 25 yards. <coughs> we did a survey, Frank Consulting, 18,400 golfers around the world, 44 countries around the world. And we did a, 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 a feasibility study of this survey in a pilot study, found out that the average golfer who shoots between 90 and 94 hits the ball 192 yards, but he thinks he gets 230 yards or more. The average female drives about 145 yards. Now imagine this, uh, we want to roll the ball back for this guy, and then he's not hitting the ball far enough. So, often, how many times you get somebody, well, I hit the ball into the rough, uh, and you go, go where you think it is, and then go back 40 yards, and you're probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> it happens frequently. <coughs> now, to get forward, all right? One of the best initiatives that, that have happened recently, I wrote about it in my first book, uh, Just Frank, I mean, Just Hit It, Just Frank. <laughs> And, and, and now we've got, now we've got people are saying, oh, we've really got to tee it forward. Okay, so we tee it forward, and we're going to tee it from, from there, all right? And we're going to move to here. All right, now what's happened is you can see this guy over here, this guy who's playing from here, they're right in those bunkers and everything else, and he's not a very happy camper. And now he's going up here, and he gets all the way out there, a little bit straight, but he's not in any trouble, and he's a real happy camper. And then suddenly, oh, now we're going to roll the ball back. Wait a minute. We've just moved it up. Now you're going to roll it back. Does it make any sense at all? You know, in my calculations, plus 25, minus 25 equals zero. Huh? Doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing that? Here we go. 35 million golfers were affected by the groove rule change. Well, they haven't been affected yet, but in 2024, there will be totally, everybody has to have the new groove. And it was because the pros on the tour were getting into the rough, and they were coming out with, 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 without any problem, two and a half inch rough, and they blamed it on the, roof, on the groove. So we're gonna change the groove. So we went from where we had it, I mean, originally it was this groove, that was back in 1942. Then we went to this groove because 
people were unable to make a V-shaped shaped groove, and so we changed it to a square groove, and so we had, we, I mean, we had this one. That was the old groove. Unfortunately, you can't make it like that until you machine it. But that's was, so we put a depth in and a width, and now they've changed it to this, and it hasn't had any effect at all on the tour. 1963, Jack won the long drive contest, 341 yards, and he, he told me it was 17 inches as well, and he said, yeah, I've got, and we had a long chat, we were sitting down, he slapped his, his billfold on the table, and, and he had this big gold money clip with money in it. He said, there it is, that's the trophy for that thing. And he says it was 341 inches, 17 inches. Anyway, he did it, and he did it with a facility driver and a terrible golf ball. And the next uh, five days later, he won the championship, the PGA Championship in 1963. But the first hole, he drove the ball 350 yards. This driver was only 42 and 5 eighths inches long. Now he's concerned about distance. I've got to let you understand that if we bounce a golf ball on a piece of concrete, it's going to bounce a certain height. And you make that ball as hot as you possibly can, it'll bounce a little higher. Yep. And then what you do is you put a little spring on the concrete and the ball, now you've tuned them both, and it'll never bounce higher than from where you dropped it. Oh, but with all the new materials, guy, and with everything else, that surely we're going to be able to do that. Well, if we could ever bounce the ball higher than from where we, where we dropped it, we wouldn't need all these windmills out here generating electricity. We wouldn't get any oil from the Far East. We could generate enough electricity from bouncing golf balls to, to give us all the energy we need. We can't do that. Energy is just not available to us. So there is an absolute limit on how high the ball will bounce if we ran really close to that. So there's no more distance available. There isn't. Believe it or not, now you've optimized your launch condition. You've got a coefficient of restitution of 0.83. Even if you didn't have it, the maximum is about 0.92. So Mother Nature actually is the, is the controlling factor here. Little help from the USGN RNA. Okay, I want, I want to, because distance has been increasing, we know it's been increasing, and I want people to give me some general idea of how far the ball has increased in the last six years. I'm going to give you a number, just put your hand up, uh, 20 yards, 10 yards, 5 yards, 1, 2, 5 yards, 2 yards, okay, okay. It's actually increased total in the last six years, two and a half feet. two and a half feet in the last six years. That's the average driving distance on the tour. Now, I'm very concerned about skill, and so I decided to go back to some spot that I could find where I could actually analyze the data over a long period of time. So the Masters from 1934 to 2010 I've got here, and I plotted the winning scores, the fifth place scores, the 15th and the 25th place scores. And I plotted them and said, well, let me see if, 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 they, if they're converging, if they're coming together in some way or another. So I did that and how I found out that in actual fact, the scores are converging. You can see the 25th place scores are coming down. This is a regression line. And this is the, this is the winning scores. Now, if you're an underachiever or you don't want the publicity, I can assure you that you can stay in 25th place long enough and you'll win in 2,144. <laughs> so you just hang on a bit and you stay in 25th place. <laughs> However, you've got to also remember 2,028. <laughs> <laughs> so you may not even make it. Okay, the game's not growing. 18,400 responses we got. 
and we did a survey, why people are playing, why they quit playing. This is very interesting. They hit, want to hit good shots. That's what they want to do. And the challenge is what they want to do. Outdoors, okay, social, all the rest of this thing is not there. But that's exactly what they want to do. They want to hit good shots. That's why we need good, well-educated golf instructors now and who understand the science of golf. And it's not the complicated science of golf. It's just the simple aspect of science of golf. Good sound instruction, specifically putting instruction, is the next big major innovation in golf. You can't go buy bike clubs anymore. You've got nothing out there that's really going to help you very much. The balls are optimized. So it requires a clear understanding and that it's based on good science. We can actually improve golf instruction, and specifically putting instruction, into a structured systematic science rather than a questionable art form. Golfers want to putt better. They really want to. Better. And they want lessons. Again, a survey we did on this. <coughs> 73% have not been fitted for their putter. 67% have not had a dedicated putting lesson. The putting lesson comes at the end of the full swing lesson. Okay, we come off the driving range, let's go out and we get a few bunker shots, we get some chip shots, a few other things. Generally, that's how it, how it happens. Generally. 93% would take a, 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 or would consider taking a putting lesson from a certified putting instructor. The market is ready, waiting. Good putting instruction. This is good for the game, and it's good for you and your lesson revenue. Absolutely important. A lot of you guys just want to make money and teach and be good teachers, but all of this can come together. It can all come together. Why do we need to consider a scientific approach? Now, this is something we've, I've been talking about for some time. It's very unfortunate. PGA of America give you very good instruction, cost you about ten thousand dollars to get your PGA uh, class A status. Another four hundred and fifty dollars a year to stay in good standing, and then about five hundred or so over a period each year to to get your MSRs to keep your education going. But nowhere in that thing do they teach you specifically how to fight or how to instruct that. So I ask the question, where did you learn how to play? Most cases, their father taught them. People, you probably had your father or relative or somebody, or you've got, or you've got, you've got magazines, you read something about, you, you watched other people doing it. Or professionals, sometimes professionals, or when you don't have anywhere else to go, you go to the gurus. Who are the gurus? Well, I haven't given them names, you can probably figure it out for yourself. <laughs> However, this is only just a small sampling. Guru S, P, and G, U, the grip in the fingers, parallel hands along the lifelines. The palm, straight outside or inside going back, along the target line going through. Straight back, straight through. On and off, back and through. Drill, left hand only. Teacher can clip on the putt. Right hand only. Putter style, toe down blade with or without alignment lines, face balance mallet with alignment lines, toe down blade with no alignment lines. Speed, die at the hole. <coughs> 17 inches past the hole, die at the hole and lag past the hole on short putt. If you die at the hole, it means that it has to be going at zero miles an hour on the edge of the hole. Nobody can do that consistently, so half of them aren't even gonna go in. So it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a problem. There's no consensus amongst the gurus about technique, speed of the putt, or even the putter touch. It's a problem. So I have a solution. Understand the scientific principles supporting the fundamentals of putting. Now I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you, I mean these basically are the fundamentals. I am gonna tell you that fitting is, is very critical. You can't teach somebody how to drive a car unless they, they properly, uh, uh, have the seat adjusted properly. We're, fitting is very, very important. Otherwise, everything you teach is a compromise. The grip, I'm not going to tell you how to grip the cutter, but I'm going to give you three or four different options and understand the consequences of getting it one grip versus another grip, etc. I'm not going to tell you how to grip it, but understand why and what you're going to be doing on, on the grip. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's get back. <laughs> 
Let's just quickly go down this. Then we go to four positions. Four positions recommended based on your overall anatomical movements. Where is it? Don't take it outside of your feet. Inside, preferably a little ahead of center. Alignment. Generally, it's better to have everything aligned. And we've got good, <coughs> solid science to show you why. Rock and rock, you have to. You have to try. You don't want to get somebody wrist breaking all the time. So rock and roll, put it up there. It's very basic. We all do some of these things anyway. But you can, some of us don't know why we're doing it. That's one of the things. Here we go. Swing plane. If you understand the swing plane, everything else comes together. And you minimize the degrees of freedom. Okay, rhythm. Understand the moment of inertia of the system. Understand why good rhythm is what it is and your own natural rhythm. These are the things. I move. There's a lot of research done on what you should be looking at, why you should be looking at it, and when. Pre-shot routine. Now you get into the pre-shot routine where it becomes very much more mental. Now it becomes a subconscious thing. We all know that when you are putting, as long as you know the fundamental, now you've got to go into the pre-shot routine thing. Green weed. There's a lot of physics done on reading. Practice drill. A lot of people don't even know how to practice. And then you've got to transfer your skills from the golf course to the thing. Now, these are based on literally scientific principles, presented in easy to understand in terms of allowing students to better understand what they're being taught and why, and giving you the confidence that you know what you, why, why you're teaching certain things. This is our advisory board. Now, I think these guys are scientists, they're researchers, they've been researching golf all around the world, and as a matter of fact, Bob Christina is now working on, on, on uh, the new uh, manuals for the PGA, he and, he and uh, uh, Eric Offenfels, both of these two guys, so that they're working on that right now, but they're not doing anything on putting. Debbie Cruz is one of the best psychologists, and, and I'm a movement people. Yep, Mike Kirsten, uh, uh, who you may have heard of, is a uh, uh, guy in, in uh, golf course architecture. Lou Riccio, statistical performance, he's at Columbia University. Phil Martin, MG Orin, who you know, and Nick Price. Uh, Paul Shen, Paul Shep is an expert in learning. George Springer from Stan Sanford. Uh, Dick Stroud, Joan Vickers, one of the best eye movement people. Frank Werner, a physicist. So we've got a good bunch of people. Now, somebody says to you, could you please explain to me the six degrees of freedom? This is one of your members. And you sort of go to them and say, um, sorry, I, I, I just don't understand. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. And yet it's simple. Let me explain. We have six degrees of freedom in putty, and every degree of freedom has an error associated with it. And so if we can minimize those degrees of freedom, we minimize the sources of error. And it's relatively simple. And, and when you look at it, you'll find out that that's basically what you do. You mustn't move the ball up and down. You mustn't move the ball in and out. The club head, I mean, talking about the club head, the club head. Then there's a back and forward motion, the degree of freedom, you have to have that, otherwise you can't hit the ball. The wrist break, you mustn't wrist break the wrist. Wrist and forearm rotation. The wrist and forearm don't rotate. They don't rotate. You are actually putting, the putter head follows an arc. It does not follow a straight back, straight through. But it's not because you're trying to make an arc, it's because you're putting in a plane. And the plane is inclined and therefore it proves that, that the straight back, straight through just doesn't work. Anatomically, it's not right. And then there's the overall weight shift. Those are the six degrees of freedom. So someone comes to you and one of your members says, will you explain to me the six degrees of freedom? We'll say, well, as a matter of fact, I can. These are the six degrees of freedom, and if we minimize those, we're going to go ahead and, and make them more consistent. Do we understand green reading, really? Do we understand the physics of it, or just the simple aspects of it? Yes. Everybody's starting to talk about the four line. That's the first thing you got to do. Find the four line. And believe it or not, believe it or not, there's one target point. It's assuming that this area is planar. In other words, absolutely the same slope. Exactly the same slope. If it is all the same slope and all these balls are the same distance away from the hole, there's absolutely one target point that every ball must be aimed at proven over and again, a 
second time Bob Grove has done it. He's got a video on it showing us how it works. And you can imagine how I heard, actually it is correct because if there's one target point over there, at 90 degrees that's the maximum break. Down here it's a minimum break. You see that, and even on top you see it's a minimum break. So it makes a lot of common sense. But that's just the simplified version of how you start reading green. Do you understand the speed of the, of the puck? The speed of the puck must be that. Okay. Ideally 1.5 miles an hour. And the reason is we want to minimize precession. Everybody's seen that. And that's because as the ball dies, it suddenly goes one way or another. That's called precession. Same thing if you had a bicycle wheel in your hand and you spin it and, and it's spinning away and you try and tilt it one side like that, it actually turns. That's how you can ride a bicycle without holding the handlebar. Because it does this, it's called precession. And that's exactly what happens to a ball. So you've got to get it through that, that, that critical stage. This is our research center at, at, at Reunion. Where we've done a lot of our research on the greens here at Florida. And we've got nine case studies. Yeah, Bernard Langer. He a great short putter. I tell you, he putts extremely well on the short putt. The long putter, he wanted to know whether he rocked his shoulders more or would he, would he putt with his hands. He found out after three hours of real kinematic analysis, we worked with him, that he's rocking his shoulders. Alex Rocher, he lost his car. He just nearly won the prize, I think it was, just a week ago. We managed to get him to regain his, his car. Andy Zhang. Andy Zhang is the 14-year-old, the youngest to have ever qualified for the U.S. Open. He started off with a long putter. We quickly sh uh, sh uh, started off. Now he's gone to a left blow. Not, not necessarily that I've recommended that. He feels most comfortable with that. That's all right. And, and, and he was tied at the U.S. Open. He was tied for seventh in putting stack for the first 36 holes. 14 years old. Frank Novello. He learned more in two hours than, than he did 10 years on the tour, he said taking the, the top back, sweeping it down low, and coming up, and when he, when, he, when he started doing it, he had all the freedom, and suddenly he said, well, I, wonder, I wish I'd had this many, many years ago. Mark Mullis, a Sunshine Tour guy, he attributes his success in the Telecom Championship to our work with him. Scottish and South African teams, we coach both of them. Now, also David Law, who, who uh, is a, was the U.S. Amateur in the British Amateur Championship or the Scottish Amateur Championship and now has turned pro. He's also become a, 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 and we teach them all based on the basic, the basic principles or the basic fundamentals we're talking about. This is something you've got to understand. If you have somebody playing for golf for a long period of time, you don't try and change them. Especially a guy like, 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 um, like Greg Floyd. He's got a terrible golf swing. Very effective. He's been practicing it, he's been working it, he's very effective, but you don't, can't change it. So you've got to work around that and make it as consistent as possible. This guy had the yips. And let me show you, it was three hours of work to change this guy from the yips, which he did literally after three hours. And now he's putting lights up. One year later, he's a producer of, of a TV sh show. And absolutely wonderful, but that's the yips in the uh, area we work on. The Certified Putting Instructor, uh, it's an online course, covers the critical principles and certainly a lot of things that most of the golfers, most golf teachers, putting teachers don't really understand. They will, or if they've got it, degrees of freedom, swing plane, the projected arc, the system inertia, and putter technology, you must understand the putter. If you don't understand the instrument that you're working with and the technology, you're not going to be able to maintain your status as the go-to guy. Certified putting instructor course. Expand your knowledge base, improve your status as a professional. Very important because it's knowledge. Provide a systematic and structured approach to your putting instruction. Giving you confidence that what you are teaching is correct. Now you know it's based on scientific principle. You've probably been teaching a lot of it anyway, but you didn't know why. But now you know, but now you've got the confidence, and they give you, and that confidence goes over to your students. Increase your Lesson revenue. We've had uh, certified putting instructors a report from 150 to 700 percent increasing their revenue. Now, this is important. 
comprehensive cutting instruction is not available to you during your education to go as class A professional. Yes, there is a minimal amount, but certainly not to, not to the extent that the full screen coaching is. And that's the very reason why the PJs around the world, seven of them, have adopted this particular course. Okay. The competitive marketplace, PGA professional level credibility is more important than ever, and adding a CPI course is a great way to do justice to that. That's Monty Coke up in Northern Cal. As a recent CPI graduate, I now feel I have the organized structure and presentation for my putting instruction. The CPI course has given me a new and vital information to pass on to my students and allow me to spend more time teaching part of the game so crucial to the sport, good scoring. That's Tom Bushman. As an instructor, we need to uh, accumulate as much knowledge as we can and excel in our craft. When it comes to putting, you owe it to, to yourself to listen to Frank Thomas, clearly an expert in the subject, and check the CPI for the half of the PGA. Okay. Course objectives. Increase your knowledge base. Increase your education. That's what it's about. Give you an education. Add to your income stream. Know what you teach is based on good scientific principles, giving you the confidence that you need to be able to teach. Maintain your professional PGA status. You get MSR points, but at the same time, you gain respect. You can be, become certified. We have 300 uh, certified putting instructors around the world. It's anybody who, who qualifies and is certified gets added to this list. People can go to the list and see where you are, and you zoom in, find exactly the phone number and the individual, where they are located, etc. That's it. And then, to in conclusion, will an understanding of the science of golf help enhance your golf instruction? sitting around for another five minutes or so, and I'll be able to answer questions. If I can't answer them, Valerie will, and Valerie can't, Phil Harvick will. <laughs> yes? What's the cost of the program, the CPI program, the online course? The, the, the program is $575. As a matter of fact, I was just talking to Tom. We're giving $50 to the foundation, and for, we take $50 off that price for, for you because of the Southern Cal group. So we're trying to work with the Southern Cal, so it's a special right. deal we do. So it'll be, whatever that is, 400, I mean, 500, what, 500. Yeah. But you can make that back in about two weeks. Our record, the individual who's, who's scored, who's uh, done it quickly, is we've had a guy do it in three days, certified. Normally it takes about two weeks. It's an online course, eight hours online. And, and uh, we've had, Five, five guys who failed but redid, reset the course. The one guy who failed and we just took him off. Yes? Were you saying that the stroke should go low to high or not to do that? On what? You were talking about Craig Navalo and... Uh... Oh, right. No, no. If, 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 you, if you're pivoting about the right point and you're, you're about your spine, you're going to pivot naturally in a nice arc. Okay. But uh, for some reason or other, many people thought that going... Dragging it along the ground is a good way to do it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Right. Everything is based on the, on the, on the body move. The body wants to move symmetrically. The body wants to move nice and smoothly. And so we've just got to allow it to do that. The problem is in your learning process, we, the mind has to tell the body what to do. The, it teaches the body what to do. And then it becomes a subconscious action. And then the mind must get out of it out of its own way. The mind must get away from instructional control, and now it becomes a, 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 an acquired ability and a, and a subconscious move. We've got to allow that to happen. And that's the mental side of the game of golf, which the, the, the program offers you as well. And Valerie is a sport psychologist, worked on brain activity and eye movement while fighting. So we have a lot, and some of our consultants work on that. Yes? Um, this, the question was putting weight in the, in the heel on the grip of a putter to try and balance it. 
You don't need to balance a putter. You need a head weight on a putter. That's all you need. You don't need to balance it. Swing weight is for full swing, and swing weight has been is a static balance. It's more closely related to moment of inertia. And the only time you need to balance your putter with, with, a, swing, with a swing weight scale is if you intend to throw it in the lake. <laughs> but I can assure you that, that uh, head weight is critical, and that's all you really have to worry about. If you ever put some putters on and a belly putter or a long putter on a swing weight scale, I mean, it's ridiculous. You've got to understand the moment of inertia of the system. Your arms, your shoulders, and the putter, and everything is, is, a, is a single unit, just like a pendulum, and it has a certain moment of inertia. That's where you get your rhythm and your natural rhythm, and that's what we're to dictate. And, and, the, and the 350. Is there an ideal head weight? About 350. You can go anywhere between 330 and 380, but, but 350 is about the, the, the best head weight that's out there. Yes? They, they, we've got them, we've got heel shafted, all of them are face balanced. Face balancing is important, we believe, and, and all of them are face balanced, but the heel mounted uh, offset, heel centered offset or center, right? That would depend on the person, right? it, It's a person who, 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 it's a preference, it's a personal preference. People try to say, well, if you have an arcing putt, you've got to have a toe down putter. That's nonsense. That is absolute, there's no scientific evidence to show that's the case because you take the putter back in a single plane. If I had a putter up here, I'd take it back like that and I'd hit the ball like that. I don't move it and it doesn't, the pace doesn't change. Take it down here, it's exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. All you've done is taken the plane down from a horizontal plane to a 10 degree plane and it moves in that plane. And if you look at that vertically, you'll see it describes an ellipse, which is the arc which proves that in actual fact, straight back straight it doesn't work. Yes? Uh, what about grip size? About grip size. Yeah. Uh, that's also a little bit of preference. Uh, uh, people, ha uh, you can, uh, the grip, the pressure on the grip is critical. There must be a very light pressure on your grip. And grip, a bigger grip generally helps a little lower, a lower you know, decreases the, the, the pressure on the, on the grip. So, you know, you've seen these grips, uh, what do they call them? Strokes, super stroke. Yeah, super stroke and, and, and the 55 thing. We use it on some of our putters. And it's not a bad grip, and it's also the same size all the way down, so it does help if you want to change your grip from a left flow to a right flow, or however you do it. We prefer to su suggest that you go with a left, uh, you know, the, the overlap, the reverse overlap. That's what 90% of the putters do. But there's no reason why you can't go to the other groups. But understand the consequences of doing that, and understand why that, you know, what, what the concerns are. And this, this course does, and this course also goes through putter technology. It's, it's, it's very important to understand why, why the putter works the way it does. And understand the history of putters. You know, the best, the most popular putter in the world was the bullseye. And it's a terrible putter from a point of view of moment of inertia. For about 20, 30 years, how long was that popular? At least that. And then the ping came in. And then everybody's copied the ping and now we got the mallets. You had a question? Yeah, I don't know if it's a silly question or not, but does the pendulum, the size of you know the pendulum change based on the length of the putt? I mean, do you go off one arc or pendulum, or okay. does it change? Okay, you, you, the, the pendulum is pivoting about the third thoracic vertebra, about. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the process that you're moving through. However, it is just like a pendulum, even though it's inclined at 10 degrees, it does have the same properties as a pendulum. Gravity is pulling it down into impact. There's a very, very slight acceleration coming into impact. But you don't tell anybody that because if you do be caught, they're gonna do that. So you have to just make sure that they have, but the rhythm is dictated by the inertia of the system and it's a natural, very natural rhythm. And you can find your own natural rhythm. Mine's a little different than yours, but you can find your own natural rhythm. Now, once you've got that, Every putt has the same rhythm. You just take it back a little further. A pendulum swings, and if you take it really high, it's going to swing faster down the bottom, like a baby in a swing. The feet are going to go the, across the ground very much faster. You don't take them back that high. The frequency or the rhythm is exactly the same. So you, the only difference between short putts and long putts is the distance you take it back. But, believe it or not, you don't want to calculate that. You don't want to even think about it. It's like, you want to throw the ball to me, a ball, just take the ball and throw it to me, I'll move across the room and you throw it again. You don't think about it. You have a natural ability to do that. It's like throwing darts. Hmm. Right. 
Yeah. Eye dominance, number one, and number two, what, what should we be looking at, how the eyes work relative to what you were talking about earlier? Okay. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence that eye dominance has, has, has any effect. Um, uh, uh, John Vickers, who's done a lot of work on, on, on eye movement and what, what to look at. Um, we, we, we know we are born with either the left or right eye dominant. Sometimes we have no, no, no particular dominance and we can change it. My eyes used to be right eye dominant. I moved to left eye dominant because I also studied medical. I was starting to do my pre-med first and I did a lot of work with it through a microscope. So I used to do looking through this thing, that made my left eye more dominant. But it really, once you've got your, your eye dominance, once you know what your eye dominance is, it doesn't matter what it is, you see everything specifically. You don't have to look at me and say, well, okay, I'm left eye dominant, so I've got to move this way. <laughs> see? Or move that way. That, that doesn't happen. Your eyes will adjust. In fact, there have been research studies that have taken lenses, prisms, Put it on your, on your, in your eyes, on, on your, in, in the spectacles. The prism turns everything upside down, completely upside down. Everything. And within an hour and a half, people are absolutely normal again. They, they're looking at everything upside down, but they can see everything. And then when they take them off, it goes all crazy until another hour, hour again. <laughs> the, mind, the mind resets. So eye dominance is, is, is not, and we haven't seen any evidence to show that it has any effect whatsoever. But again, you may feel a little more comfortable with one putt versus putter versus another one. That's your personal preference. But we can't see any evidence of that. As far as looking at where you should be looking, when you do look at a ball, at, uh, when you're over the ball, when you're in the automatic mode, what you do is you get over the ball, make sure you look at your ball, look at the target. You, once you've lined it up, you've got your target on. Once you've lined the putter up, and to do that, Choose a point about four or five feet ahead of the ball, because looking 20 feet ahead is very difficult to line up. So choose a spot, you see a little spot on the green, and you say, well, okay, I'll line that up with the line, but or it's, it's an inch to the left of that. Line up your putter with that. Now, once you line it up, and you know what you're looking at, now look at the, at the, at the target, and you come back again a second time, and then you just let it go. That's when you go into the order, order mode. It's, it's very, very critical to understand the psychology involved. And don't put a line on the ball. Don't put a line on the ball and try and line it up because very often, very often, you get over the ball, and you look at that line, and it's not going the direction you think it should be going. Now you've got conflict, and you don't need any conflict when you go. And a, a bunch of research has been done on that too. There's no evidence that putting a line on the ball does you any good. Yeah. Somebody else? If it's over the ball, does it matter if about your eyes are directly over or inside out? No, the ball, it, it should be it should be directly over the ball if you possibly can. Inside of it a little bit, not outside of it. Uh, that's one of the things that Jack, in my new book, uh, I've quoted Jack Nicholas frequently about this putting and how who taught him to putt and everything else. But but that's one of the things that that, that was very consistent. Uh, and it allows you to look down the line more effectively. If you're not over, uh, to, to make a point to exaggerate, if the ball was about three feet away from you, it's very difficult to line it up down the target line over there from the side. So you've got to come up this way and look at it down the line that way. It makes it very much easier. And it's a very consistent point. And consistency is what we're looking for, very much. Yes? Frank, what's your opinion of uh, belly putters and long putters with a Okay, well that's a very sensitive subject right now. But the USJ wants to get rid of the belly putters and the long putters. Not necessarily get rid of them, they want to get rid of the anchoring to the body. Uh, first of all, the belly putter, I'm not a fan of belly putting at all because it introduces another source of error. The long putter is more efficient than a belly putter. And, and so, uh, and, and, but it does, you know, the belly putter gets rid of the, the wrist break so you don't get that. And, and as long as your belly's not too soft, you know, it gets rid of the up and down motion a little bit. So, so that, 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 but unfortunately it's pivoting about two points. The head of the putter is pivoting about your belly and your hands are pivoting about the, the pivot beyond your spine. So if you take it to an extreme, you'll see you'll have to break, start breaking your wrists up there. 
So I'm not a big fan of the belly pattern, long pattern. Um, the US chain RNA wanted to stop anchoring. I don't know what anchoring means. I've been on their case for a little while. They haven't made a decision yet. I know that Mike Davis was talking to the PGA Pro guys uh, last week or this last week, and, and, and they haven't come to any, any decision yet. But it's very, very difficult to, you know, to, to, to define what anchoring is. Anchoring with a belly putter is no problem. It's sticking in your belly button. Okay? But anchoring with a long putter, where, is it when the, when the putter actually touches your, your, your chest? And, and, and maybe if your thumb is around it, so if your thumb is touching your chest, is that anchoring? And then if you move your thumb half an inch away, is that still anchoring because your arm is anchored? Or if you move it this way, is it still anchored? So what happens is you're going to develop a rule which is ambiguous. You cannot have an ambiguous rule. As I said earlier on, golf is the only sport where you call yourself on infraction. But you have to know what the infraction is. And if nobody tells you exactly what anchoring is, how can you go ahead and monitor yourself and, and call yourself on? So uh, the, the long pattern has saved a lot of people for, from the years. I'd rather try and cure it, but there's some people so that that's one thing. After that, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that the USJ is going to go through it. I think it's a very difficult decision. Yes? You mentioned that there's no effect of tell hang, that that's just not I, I didn't hear that. You mentioned that there's a lot of... Uh, Marketing about toe hang and, and different putters. Why do you believe face balance is the way to go now? I believe face balance is, is, is a better putter simply because when you move, there's a slight acceleration, as I told you, move the putter into impact. A face balance putter would want to try and line itself up along the, uh, the line of the, of the, of the, of the you're moving it in. It wants to try and adjust it. Whereas a, a face balance, that's just a small force, uh, I mean, a toe down wants to open up a little bit when you're coming through because you're forcing it. So that's what it is. It really doesn't make any difference. You've seen people push super well with, with toe down putter. They're moving you a little bit close, and that's one of the, the reason why that gooseneck is in the, in the hosel many times because you want to move the center of gravity a little further forward, getting it closer to a, a sort of a half toe down or a, or a 45 or whatever the toe down is. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big, big fan of, of, of toe down. I prefer a, 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 a mallet. But again, what, what I, you know, it's, it's what fits you best. If you're really good, the, the, the blade putter is very forgiving across the face, but it's not forgiving up and down. So that's where a mallet, when you have a mallet, you better have a face putter. No. Every mallet must be face balanced. Is there a science behind that? You kept saying it's your preference. Is, did you have science behind it? The science behind it is that when you're moving, it, moving the putter through, you'll see. If I take a face balanced putter and I, and I just hold it up like this and I force it up like that, it's going to stay that way. If I'm holding a, a toe down putter, or, but having the face horizontal, and then move it up, you'll see it'll twist. It's a mo basically on moments when you're putting a force onto it. But again, it's such a small thing, and what we try to do is get rid of all the sources of error of, of, of the instrument. And so there's a preference, say, so if you want to get rid of them, but you know, don't tell me that Tiger Woods can't putt. And he's got a, he's got a toe down putter. But he's learned how to do it. He's worked his butt off. But if most of your most of your clients need a more forgiving player, as they do with their with their rest of their club.